chapter I want to focus on there is beginning in verse number 14 when Jesus is speaking unto the church of Laodiceans and He says this, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, skip down to verse number 18. Here's the remedy. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And then he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And the title of my sermon this morning is Be Zealous. I'm going to preach about having a zeal of God. Now, we, as Christians, we may look around and we may look at one person and say, yeah, he seems like he's zealous. And then we may look at another person and say, well, he seems like he has less zeal than another guy. But there, is a specific, there are specific attributes in the Bible that define whether a person has zeal or not. And every time the word zeal, every time the word zealous comes up, there's always particular characteristics that define whether that person has zeal and whether that person is zealous for God or not. Obviously, this morning, it's going to be an encouragement to you. It's going to be an edification for you to, you know, to look in the Bible and to examine yourself and to see, hey, and do I fall into this category or not? Do I have zeal? You know, it's an encouragement to be zealous. And you may be a Christian today that used to be zealous and you're not anymore. And that's what the Independent Baptist Movement is like today. Yeah. The Independent Baptist Movement, and if I, had to, if I had to give one reason why I think that they've fallen, you know, from the course that they that they've went astray, the independent Baptist movement, I would say that it's because they lost their zeal. That's what I would say. Amen. When you go into these modern independent Baptist churches and you sit down and you listen to the singing and they're singing the hymns, they have no zeal. They're not passionate and they, they, aren't, they don't care about what they're singing about. You can see that. And then you know why the preaching is boring when you're in these churches? You know what, why you know, when the pastor gets up behind the pulpit and he starts preaching his sermon and then just everybody walks away, you know, just feeling just bored and they feel worse than they did when they came in? It's because the preacher behind the pulpit isn't zealous about what he's talking about. Amen. And, you know, what happens is the leader that's up here, if he's zealous about his sermon, if he's zealous about the word of God, then the congregation is going to be zealous. Yep. So a lot of it falls back on the preacher. A lot of it falls back on the pastor of the church. So the reason why, in turn, because of that, all of the people in the congregation aren't reading their Bible and they're not zealous is because the preacher is not zealous behind the pulpit. That's where it all goes back to. And the root of the problem of, and just individually as well is because just the people in the churches, the pastor behind the pulpit, they have no zeal. Now let me say this because we're in this chapter. This is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Dispensationalism is total and absolute garbage. Amen. Number one. But here's the thing. These people have like a self-fulfilling prophecy because they, they divide up, you know, the Laodicean church age. They have all of these church ages within, you know, within the church age itself, wherever they get that from. They have all these different church ages. <coughs> and then they, they look at the Laodicean church age and they say, see, that's the last church age. That's the church age we're in today. You know what? I, I, I could see if a person picked up the Bible and they looked at these independent Baptist churches, the one that preached the, you know, this type of trash, this type of dispensational, if they looked at the people that are preaching this, and they could see, well, that does make sense. Because the churches today are, they are lukewarm. They aren't zealous. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you actually get a definition of what zeal is from this passage right here. Look at, look at Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 14 again. We'll start right where he begins to address the church of Laodicea. And he says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now watch what he says. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. Now the first thing I want to point out is, notice the very first thing that he mentions is their works. That's the very first thing that he brings up. And then right after that, he says, I would 
that thou wert cold, or he, no, he says that thou art neither, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. And then he says at the end, I would thou wert cold or hot. So he's basically saying, like he defines it in verse 16, that they're lukewarm. That they're in this intermediate stage, basically. That they're moderate. He's saying that they're complacent. Because when you go down, he further defines it in verse number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. And then he says, and have need of nothing. So their attitude that they have is an attitude of just being satisfied. Right. An attitude of being complacent. Yeah. And then you get down... And how are they going to fix the problem? He says in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Now this is what they need to do. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That means that everything that he's been talking about right now, the whole problem with, with the way that the church is being run and the way that they're living their Christian lives is that they're not zealous. That's the problem. So being lukewarm is the opposite of being zealous. Right, now look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 11, because we get a perfect definition of what, of what zeal is in the Bible, what the word zealous means. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 11. Now let me say this too while you're turning there. In order, for, you know, if a person is saved, they're saved by faith alone, not based upon any works that they've done at all. Amen. So you from the outside cannot look at a person and determine whether they're going to have it or not. You cannot see whether that person is saved because works are not, you know, works are not guaranteed in the Christian life. You know, you have to strive to live a good Christian life. You have to strive, you know, and, and it takes hard work to keep the commandments and to live a good Christian life. But let me say this too as an introduction. Zeal manifests itself. And I'm going to show you that there are particular attributes and I can look at you and I can see whether you're zealous for God. I can look at you according to the Bible, according to certain characteristics that always follow. When God brings up you know, and says, this person's zealous, there's always, every time, certain characteristics that come with it. So I can look at you and I can see whether you're zealous or not. And I can, I can use the Bible's definition of what zeal is is, and I'll be able to say, hey, this guy's zealous and this guy's not. And not using my own definition. Now look right here, we're going to just get, a, get a, a general definition of what the word zeal means. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 11. It says, for behold, this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, Yea, what vehement desire. Now watch what he says. Yea, what zeal. He just defined what the word zeal means for you. What the word zeal means, the definition of a person being zealous, is that they have a vehement desire. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, they give the same exact definition. It says, great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. So notice that they have great energy, like it's, it's vehement, like great. It says they have an energy or an enthusiasm, like a desire. And then it says that they have a particular pursuit. So they have a certain vision or they have a certain objective. That's what it means to be zealous. Now turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter number 19, verse number 11. 2 Kings chapter number 19, verse number 11. When you look up the word zeal or zealous... The person in the Bible that is most described, the one person in the Bible that is most described about being zealous have, or having zeal is God himself. Now, we often look at God and we can think like God doesn't have emotions. You know, but not only while God was upon this earth as a man, did he feel, you know, hungry and things like that upon this earth? The Bible also describes other emotions that God has while he's in heaven, that he's grieved with certain things, that he's angry with certain things. And when we look in the Bible and we want to look and try to get an idea of what the word zeal means according to God and what being zealous means, God is the one that is most mentioned that the Bible talks about having zeal or being zealous. So look at 2 Kings chapter number 19. We're going to look at verse number 31. 2 Kings chapter number 19, verse number 31. The Bible says, For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, shall do this. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 7. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 7. <clears throat> 
Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 7. It says the prophecy of Jesus Christ coming upon this earth as, uh, as the Messiah. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Same book, turn over to Isaiah chapter number 37, verse number 32. Isaiah chapter number 37, verse number 32. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 37, verse number 32 says, For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So over and over again, it references God's zeal, references yeah. the zeal of the Lord. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 59 now. Isaiah chapter number 59, verse number 16. Isaiah chapter number 59, verse number 16. It says, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, for clothing and was clad with zeal, as a cloak. So notice it says he was clad with zeal as a cloak. And what is a cloak? A cloak is not just like a shirt. A cloak is like an outer garment. So what it's saying is like he's covered with zeal. That's what he's trying, that's the point that he's trying to get across. It's saying basically that God is just like full of zeal. That's the point that it's getting across. Turn to Titus chapter number 2 verse number 13. So over and out, over again, when you look up the word zeal, when you look up the word zealous, it keeps saying, the Lord of the host shall perform it. Talking about his zeal, the zeal of the Lord of the host shall perform it. Talking about God's zeal. Look at Titus chapter number 2. We'll look at verse number 13. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 13. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So not only does God have zeal, but God desires, He has a desire, He wants us to be zealous. He doesn't want you just to be satisfied or just to be happy with the moderate Christian lifestyle. He doesn't want you, like when He was speaking you know, unto the church of Laodicea, Jesus was not happy with them when they were just complacent, when they just felt like, you know what, you know, we're coming to church every day. I mean, it's, it, they're writing to a congregation. These people were coming in and they were sitting down in church every day. You know, the, a, a church, people misunderstand the definition of the word church. It right. means congregation. Right. Yeah. Therefore, these people were coming in and they were assembling together. But right. you know what God said, even though they were assembling together? That you're not zealous. Right. So that means you might be coming to church today. You might be coming to every single service. And you might not have any zeal for God. You might not be zealous for the Christian life. Right. Now, the, my very first point comes from verse number 13. So he says, in verse number verse number yeah, 14, verse number 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So that's the number one reason why Jesus Christ died for us. Of course, he died for us to save us from our sins. But he's not satisfied with us, with us just, just being saved and living the Christian lifestyle. That's not all that he wants. Look at what it says. It says, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And my first point is, the way that you can tell whether someone has zeal, the way that you can tell whether someone is zealous, is whether they have works for God, whether they have good works. That's why it makes perfect sense when he writes unto the church of Laodicea, and he says, I know thy works. Right. And then he says that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. But because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So it makes perfect sense. And what was the remedy for not having works? For not doing much for God? The remedy was to be zealous. So that means that a person that's zealous, like this passage says, zealous of good works. It's a person that's going to have good works. Now earlier too, when we read all the passages about God, you know what it kept saying? 
It didn't necessarily say that the Lord was going to perform this. You know what it said? It said that the zeal of the Lord of hosts was going to perform this. Like it was literally God's zeal that was acting these things out. Notice it said perform. So these were actual works that were being done. These were things that God was doing. And that's my first point. If you don't come soul winning, and if you don't do anything for God, you can tell me that you have zeal until you're blue in the face, and I don't believe you. If you have zeal, it will show. If you are zealous for God, I will be able to look at you and I will be able to see by your works that you have zeal for God. Amen. That's your zealous for God. Next passage, turn to 2 Kings chapter number 10. 2 Kings chapter number 10, verse number 15. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter number 10. This is the, the famous passage with Jehu. This is probably the most famous quote including the word zeal in it. 2 Kings chapter number 10. We'll start reading in verse number 15. To verse number 15 will give us the context. 2 Kings chapter number 10 verse number 15. And when he, had, when he was departed, that's talking about Jehu. And when he was departed thence, he lighted upon Jehonadab the son of Rechab coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him, took him up, he took him up to him, to him into the chariot, and he said, Watch this, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. For they, for they, so they made him ride in his chariot. That tells me again that I should be able to look at you and I should be able to see your zeal. If you say, you know, and you can keep saying all day long. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of people that go to church every week and if you ask them, hey, are you zealous for God? They would say yes, but they do nothing for the Lord. Right. Yeah. They do nothing. Can they come up to you and can they tell you, hey, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Come soul winning with me. Follow me around all day when I read my Bible. Let me show you how zealous I am for God. Because the Bible teaches if you are zealous, if you have zeal, I can look at you and I can see your zeal. Amen. Your zeal will perform it. Your zeal, you will be zealous of good works. Do you know how to fix the problem if you don't have works? Be zealous. Amen. Over and over again, the Bible teaches that the number one attribute, if you're zealous, is works. Is actually doing something for God. It's actually acting things out or performing things. Turn again, we'll look at it again in uh, Numbers chapter 25, verse number 1. Numbers chapter 25, verse number 1. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 2 says this, And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal, to the children of Israel and Judah. Notice he's doing something. His zeal is causing him. Zeal is something that motivates you to do something. If you had zeal, if you are a zealous person for God, it will motivate you to do something. You know, you're not just going to sit around if you're zealous for God. Your zeal will perform it. Your zeal will cause you to get up and will cause you to go out soul winning. Your zeal when you're at home, you know, and sitting around, it will cause you to read your Bible. It will cause you to pray to God. It will cause you to have works to perform it. Amen. So look at Numbers chapter number 25. Numbers chapter number 25. <clears throat> Numbers chapter number 25, verse number 1. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord <clears throat> was kindled against Israel. <clears throat> the angle of anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one as men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, 
he rose up from among the congregation and took, took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now, what happened here, if you didn't understand the story or, or, or actually what the Bible was depicting or describing, was the people of Israel started, you know, started to commit whoredom in the sense of fornication, but also they started to go after the false gods of the Moabites. They were living around them at the time before they had come into the nation of Israel, or the land of Canaan, which became, which became the nation of Israel. And at that time, they started, like it said, to commit whoredoms with these other nations. And God put forth judgment upon the people that were doing this. And one guy was so you know, bold about his sin that he just brings in one of these women literally into the church. That's what congregation meant in the Old Testament. Literally into the church. And Phineas, it says, rose up. So he's sitting down. And his zeal is what, is what caused him to do this. Look at verse number 9. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. Verse number ten. Keep reading. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. Watch this. While he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. So when Phineas saw this person come in, when he saw this guy come in with this woman, and he knew that God had put forth judgment, and he was aware that the reason why they were being plagued and many people had died, and then this guy just blatantly walks in and just rubs it in everybody's face, just brings his sin upon the congregation, you know, which is bringing God's wrath upon them. And he knows that this is in direct disobedience with what God has said. Phineas, it says, rise up. He rises up and he grabs a javelin and he literally thrusts the javelin through both of them at the same time. At the same time. And it goes through her belly and in him and out the other one. And what was the reason why he did something like this? Because he was zealous. Because he had zeal. He saw this, and because of the zeal, because of the burning desire, like it said over in 2 Corinthians, the vehement desire that he had for serving God, that's what compelled him. That's what motivated him. That's what drew him, drew him to do something like this for God. Now, turn to, turn to John chapter number 2, verse number 12, and I'll tell you my second point. My second point is that if you have a zeal of God... You will have a righteous anger. Over and over again, every single time that the Bible talks about someone having zeal, even when it talked about God, every time when it talked about God's zeal, but one time, only in Isaiah chapter 9, it was talking about Him bringing vengeance upon people. Over and over again. Even in 2 Corinthians where we found our definition, it has the word vengeance there. And then it has the word zeal. It says vehement desire and then it says zeal. Then we see Phineas right here. And Phineas isn't happy. There's no Nobody can doubt the fact if, 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 if a sane person read this passage, saved or not saved, they would walk away saying that guy was angry. Amen. That guy wasn't happy. If you, if you have zeal, another thing that you will have along with that is a righteous anger. What did Saul do, the passage that I read to you when it said he had zeal? It said that he went forth to slay the Amorites. He went forth to kill the Amorites. Every time you see the word zeal brought up, Number one, you see somebody doing something. You see work. Just like I said earlier, too, when I, about Jehu. What did Jehu go do? When he said, come, you know, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord, do you know what he went and did? He went and killed a bunch of wicked people right after that. He jumped in the chariot with him, and they went and slew a bunch of wicked people. They went and killed a bunch of wicked people. Do you expect me to believe he was happy while he was doing that? He might have enjoyed killing bad people. But he, the reason why he was killing them was because he had a righteous anger, because these wicked people were destroying his country, Amen. because these wicked people were destroying his nation. Yeah. Jehu had a righteous anger. Every single time the word zeal is brought up in the Bible, it always, number one, has someone doing something. They always have works. And number two, they have a righteous anger. Look at John chapter number two. John chapter number two, we'll begin reading in verse number 12. It says, after this, he, talking about Jesus, went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. <clears throat> and the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, that's a whip, 
He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. This is not the Jesus that most people would say they're Christians believe in. And we see right here real clearly, Jesus is not happy. He's not smiling. Do you expect me to believe that He was smiling while He did this? Jesus was not happy with what was going on. He shows up for the Passover. He shows up for a feast to me, and obviously to celebrate a feast that God had sanctioned and God had ordained. And then He walks into the temple... And he sees all these people just making merchandise. Basically, they're, they're using this location because it's a central location and because people need, you know, the people are coming at this time to get sac to uh, bring sacrifices. And people, you know, need, they need, obviously they needed to change their money and stuff, but they need to do that somewhere else. Right. They need to go somewhere else and do that. And because people were abusing and profaning and defiling God's temple, that made, that made Jesus angry. Now keep right. reading. Watch what it says. It says in verse 16, It said unto them that sold doves, Take these hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now watch verse 7. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now I want you to turn over to Psalms chapter number 69 verse 9. So notice what it said. Notice what verse that came to mind when they saw Jesus doing this. They said, he said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So what was the reason why Jesus got angry? Because he had zeal. Because he was zealous for God. And when he saw wicked things going on, and when he saw sin and filth and things that was, you know, disrespecting and being irreverent to God, it made him angry when people were doing that. It made him very mad. So look at Psalms. Chapter number 69, verse number 9. And today, you know, about of all the things that I'm going to talk about this morning, this right here is for sure what's under the most attack. And if any man wants to stand up behind a pulpit, or even just a young man that's not even a preacher, that wants to walk around, he wants to point out filth and point out things that make him angry, he is attacked all the time. Yeah. And, and especially a preacher. If you get up behind the pulpit and you have a righteous anger, and you're angry about sin, just like all the men of the of the Bible were, all the men of God throughout the Bible, they would always get angry at sin. If you try to follow in their footsteps and you get angry at sin because you actually read your Bible and you know what type of condition that things are in, then you're looked at as you're being immature or you're looked at like you're being childish. Was Jesus immature? Was Jesus being immature? Was Phineas being immature? Because the Bible says that God actually commended Phineas for his, for his zeal. God, God actually rewarded Phineas for what he had done and he stopped the plague. This is God in the flesh that was walking upon this earth and the Bible is very clear that he was angry and the Bible is very clear why. It was because he had zeal. So look at Psalms chapter number 69, verse number 9. Psalms chapter number 69, verse number 9. <clears throat> Stop it. Psalms chapter number 69, verse number 9. <clears throat> this is where that's quoted from. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Turn to Psalm chapter number 119, verse number 139. We'll see this again. So this was a quote from Jesus Christ. And it makes perfect sense because when we saw God mentioned in the Old Testament, over and over again it talked about His zeal. Right? And it talked about, you know, the God in heaven at that time said the zeal of the Lord of the hosts. Then we saw Jesus Christ, when He walked upon this earth, He also had zeal. And when you look that quote up that was talking about His zeal when He had a righteous anger, it was from David. And David is said to be, in the Old Testament, a man after God's own heart. Which makes perfect sense that David would also have zeal. That David would also have zeal, just like Jesus Christ did, just like the God in heaven at that time that it described did. Psalm chapter 119, verse number 139. Psalm chapter 119, verse number 139. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 119, 139 says again, My zeal hath consumed me. Now watch the same reason. Watch what he says. Because my enemies have forgotten thy word. So he's talking about people. When he's, when he's talking about forgotten thy words, 
He's referring to the fact that the Bible will often use statements like that, that they forgot thy law, that they forgot thy commandments, that they forgot thy words. He's referring directly to the way that they're living. Right. When he says, forgot thy word. He's talking about wickedness. He's talking about sin. Right. He's talking about... And you know who is the most critical? And I talked about this last week. I got on the Independent Fundamental Baptist Pastors last week. And I'll continue to get on them because Amen. I'm sick of it. Amen. I am Amen. sick and tired of these pastors Amen. standing up and being real pompous and wanting to try to look down. The title of my sermon last week was, Let No Man Despise Thy You. Right. Talking about how these pastors... Pastors, they want to look at young men when they want to stand up behind the pulpit and preach, and then they want to look down upon them for their youth. Right. Just like when David showed up, and that was one of my passages that I turned to. David showed up in 1 Samuel chapter number 17, and what did his older brother, his eldest brother Eliab do? He looked down upon him. He's like, where did you leave those few little sheep in the wilderness? Yeah. Then right after that, Saul, who was a saved man, ends up saying to him, you know, you're not able to do this. And it says, for he was but a youth. Talking about that's why Saul believed that. Then, immediately after that, he's getting ready to fight Goliath. And it says he dis disdained him, for he was but a youth. Do you, know what, do you know what David ended up saying right before that? When he started getting angry and his brother's like, hey, you need to calm down. Where did you leave those few little sheep in the wilderness? He said, is there not a cause? And that's what I'm going to say. How far and how bad do things have to get in this country where if a man stands up and he has a righteous anger and he's mad about what's going on and he's mad about sin, how far do they have to go where he's justified? Amen. Is there not a cause? Amen. Aren't we to the point where if I preach against filth and I preach against sin that it's justified? Right, right. And you know, well, this is what it is. It's because they stand for nothing. Right. It doesn't matter how far they go. Right. It doesn't matter until they're forced to do all this disgusting filth of marrying sodomites or doing whatever the government wants to tell them. They just go with the flow. That's, That's right. what's going on. They don't stand up for anything. Right. Right. So there's, there, for them, for these guys, there will never, never be a cause. Right. And you know what I'll stop preaching against these bunch of pansies? Is when they grow a backbone. When they Either they grow a backbone or they sit down and let somebody who really wants to preach the Bible. Right. Because when you get behind this pulpit and you call yourself a pastor and you're a saved man... You better be real careful. You better make sure before you make that decision that you're wanting to serve God with a sincere heart. And part of serving God as a pastor is preaching the whole Bible. Right. Not just preaching what people want to hear. Right. Not just preaching the parts that you like. Right. But preaching parts that offend people. Right. And you know what it tells me about all these pastors? You have no zeal. Right. You know why you don't get angry? Because you're not zealous for right. God. You know why you don't go soul winning? Because you have no zeal. Because right. you're not zealous for serving God. Amen. That's why. That's the reason why that none of these pastors are going soul winning. Do you know why the churches are dead today? Because the pastors have no zeal. That's, right. <laughs> that's, the, re that's the reason why the churches are dead Amen. today. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 18. When I read the definition of what a, what the word vision, or what the word, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, zeal was, according to the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, it said this, great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. So they have a goal. That's what being zealous is. A person that's zealous is someone that's not satisfied with where they're at. Remember when it talked about Laodicea? They were complacent. They were satisfied. They, they were, it said they had need of nothing. That means they had no goals or they had no vision. Right. Look at Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18. The Bible says this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And the reason why people are dying and going to hell in all of these huge cities where there's 50, 60, 70 Baptist churches. You know, in Kentucky, I'm not exaggerating. Right in that greater Cincinnati area where I live, I bet there's 50 churches that preach the right gospel. 50 of them. <clears throat> but the people are still perishing. You know why? Because, they, because the preachers and the pastors of these churches have no vision. They have no vision. The people in the area are dying and going to hell 
Because they don't have a vision of, of reaching all the people in their area. They don't have a goal of wanting to reach. They have like, like the definition of what zeal is. They have no objective. Therefore, they have no zeal. Amen. Number one, if you have zeal, I'll be able to look at you and see it. You should be able to say to me, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Amen. You should be able to tell me, hey, come see the works that I have. I'll prove to you that I have zeal. Number two, you have a righteous anger. And then number three, you should have some sort of vision or you should have some sort of goal. If you don't fall into, any, into, into these three categories... You personally, in your Christian life, you do not have zeal for God. If you fall into these categories, if you feel like this defines you, then you're a zealous person, according to the Bible's definition. I I'm going to Jacksonville, Florida to start a church. And the reason why I chose Jacksonville was because I, I wanted to go southeast somewhere. You know, I'm from Kentucky, so I wanted to go somewhere that I would fit in, number one. That was my first choice. Number two was this. Well, I wanted to look in the southeast area, and I was going to pick the biggest city that I could find. And it was Jacksonville, Florida. Amen. So when I go to Jacksonville, Florida, we are going to preach the gospel. My church is going to preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. And I've talked to a lot, of, a lot of people that are in Jacksonville. There's a lot of people that are actually there that are waiting for the church to be started. And many people tell me, like, hey, nobody's going soul winning. You know why? Because the pastors have no vision. Right. The people are perishing because the pastors have no vision. And I'm and I'm not I'm not kidding. When I show up within the first month, because of all the soul winning, all the preaching that's going to be going forth from the pulpit, I want all those churches, like in Acts chapter, I believe it's chapter number 17, when they say these that have turned the world upside down and come hither also, I want to send a, send a shockwave through that entire area. I want to preach the gospel to every single person in that city, and I hope the city gets even bigger than it is right now. I have a vision and a goal that I want to preach to every single person in the Jacksonville area. I want every person to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Do you know why? Because I have a vision. And I don't want the people of Jacksonville to perish. Whatever city I would have chosen, I wouldn't want them to perish. All these pastors in all these cities across America that are preaching the right gospel, they need to get a vision to Amen. reach all the people. And that should be the number one vision is to fulfill the Great Commission. Yeah. It's to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, to get people saved, to get people baptized, to get people in church and serving God. They should have a vision. And if you turn back to Revelation chapter number 3, and if you don't have a vision in your Christian life, then you have no zeal. Right. These are three characteristics of a person that's zealous. The word zealous is not used very many times. But let me tell you something. Every time it's used, the, the people that it describes are always the same. They have three characteristics every single time. Number one, you can see their works. Normally, it's describing them in a certain situation. And God says they're zealous and they're doing works. Or they're doing something you can see. Number two, they have a righteous anger. They're angry about something for the right reason. There's a, you know, there's a wrong time to be angry, of course, but the Bible gives us reasons and things that we should get angry at. And then number three is they had a vision. Revelation chapter number three. So if, you're, if you don't fall into one of these categories, <coughs> Revelation chapter number three tells you very plainly what you should do. Revelation chapter number three, verse number 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So I'm sorry there's not more instructions to give you, but it's very simple. It's very easy. You know what you need to do if you're not zealous? You need to repent. You know now the characteristics of what you should be doing in your Christian life to be a zealous person. You know what you need to do if you're not zealous? If you're not zealous for God, you need to repent. You need to start going soul winning. Amen. You need to start reading your Bible. Amen. When you read your Bible, you know what it'll give you? It'll start, you'll start living a clean life yourself, and then it will make you angry when you see sin. Right. A person right. that's living a right. wicked life doesn't get angry at other stuff because that's the way they live too. Right. Right. But if you're living a, a righteous life, you're living a clean life, it will it will create in you a righteous anger if you're reading your Bible. That's what I would say. If you want to be zealous, start reading your Bible. Start doing works for God, even forcing yourself. I remember right when I started serving God, like 21, in the very beginning, I had made the decision. Like It was something that was concrete in my mind. You know, I'm ready. I got saved when I was younger, but I'm ready to start serving God now. I wish I had done when I was younger. But I was like, I'm going to start serving God now. And you know, like 
within like, with the, like the first three to four months when I read the Bible, man, I'm not going to lie, it was hard. I had to sit down and force myself. But you know what happened after like six months, and I'm not exaggerating, probably about six months, when I had read the Bible quite a bit, I probably read you know, maybe half of it at that point, I started getting zeal. I believe zeal comes from just reading God's Amen. Word. If, if God has zeal, read His Word and you'll get His zeal. Amen. You'll get His righteous anger. You'll get the desire and the visions that He has. The vision of preaching the gospel to every creature. That's what I would do. If you don't have zeal today, you need to repent and you need to start reading your Bible. Let's bow and have a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank You for this day, dear Lord. We thank You that You're a great example for us and You're the perfect example in every situation, dear Lord God. We thank You just how clear and consistent that the Word is. And that we're able just to, to have a book that's so perfect to teach from, dear Lord. We ask you to be with us, dear God, the rest of the day. Bless all the services that we're going to have. And, uh, and just keep us safe. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 amen.